Now I'd like to welcome uh, Adar Shah, and he is a principal consultant at an organization called Contino. He's going to be talking about DevOps organizational structures and how companies can approach organizational structure and transforming using DevOps culture and practices. Please welcome Adarsh. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. So thanks for the introduction. So I'll be talking about role of team structures in DevOps transformation journey. Um, and uh, as, as Warren mentioned, uh, I work for Contino as a principal consultant. Uh, we do help organizations with DevOps transformation from all people, process, technology aspects. Uh, if you have any questions about that, talk to me later. Uh, but let's get started. Uh, the so role of team structures uh, in DevOps transformation journey. Uh, these are the four uh, different team structures I'll be talking about today. Dev and Ops collaboration, uh, up top, uh, left top. Cross-functional team, um, site reliability engineering, which is the Google model, and the last one being a platform engineering team, and see how uh, you can use these different team structures to actually uh, do a DevOps transformation. Before I get started with the different team structures, let me just uh, uh, go through the Conway's law. Um, so organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of these organizations. And what Malvin Conway means here is, in, in, in a different word, is that how you actually organize your teams uh, and how you actually have the communication structures set up between teams uh, so if you have silos, uh, your, your software that you're writing uh, and the quality of the software that you're writing will get affected as well. So if the communication structures are better uh, and the teams talk to each other, uh, they collaborate, uh, that helps in, in building uh, good software, uh, stable and reliable software. So before I start talking about uh, DevOps collaboration, this is something a lot of you must be aware of, dev and ops silos. So back in the days when, hopefully back in the days, when you have dev, you have ops, and there's usually a huge wall in between. So developers write software. Uh, they write software. They throw it over the wall to the ops side. They go have beers, celebrate the release, and then the ops uh, team actually takes care of uh, software deployment, monitoring servers, uh, responding to outages, change control, all of these other things. Um, and then they, um, if there is a production issue, they'll have, they are the ones who are looking at it first and then taking help from devs. So, of course, there are issues with this uh, structure, right? Uh, communication barriers, right? This is one of the things that when you have a wall in between, the teams don't talk to each other, you have communication barriers. Uh, what that does is, uh, you, if you have silos, so dev team is a separate team that's not talking to the ops team, uh, you have uh, a project-focused mindset rather than a product focus, so you're not uh, trying to build the best product that, that's there, but you're only focused on your functional part and making sure the project that you're assigned to is successful, but what happens to the product, the overall product, is, is what matters more. Uh, waste during handoff. So there are hands off, uh, handoff between different teams. When that handoff happens, uh, there is a wastage. The wastage is because you're dependent on different teams, and uh, each team has different priorities. They have different backlogs they have to work on. So you have to do handoffs that causes delays. Uh, those delays cause uh, increase in feature lead time. So feature lead time, when I say here, means that from the time the, the, the product asks you, uh, or a business asks you to uh, add a new feature to, that, uh, to the time when the feature actually gets to the, uh, the users in the production. So that feature lead time increases because there is a lot of handoff uh, between different teams. So in the previous diagram, it was just dev and ops, but 
uh, in, in, in a lot of organizations, you have a lot of different functional silos. So you have devs, you have QAs, you have ops. So there are multiple handoffs there. Uh, you, you might have a DBA team. Uh, so as you can see, there are multiple hands off. And then that handoff actually uh, even you know, worsens the, the feature lead time. The more handoffs there are, the more delays there are to get a feature to production. So next one being dev and ops collaboration. So here, uh, this is the diagram from earlier where you have a wall, but once dev and ops start talking to each other, uh, the wall that's there disappears. They start collaborating. They start collaborating on things like uh, software deployment, uh, so, uh, automation of software deployment, uh, application monitoring and support, uh, server provisioning and configuration. So all of these things, they start working together. Uh, they start collaborating, pairing on stories, uh, and, and automating all of those things. So when that happens, the dev, uh, after pairing with ops, they go back to their teams. Uh, now, as you see, that the dev that was red is now purple, which means they have the ops capabilities, that uh, the, the knowledge that they gain from talking to the other side here. Uh, and then they take care of the deployment of software themselves, uh, provisioning and monitoring it in production. So they take ownership of the product that they are building and uh, deploy it, maintain it in production so that uh, that gives them uh, the knowledge of the other side, uh, and then that helps in, in make, uh, building the right product. Uh, so some of the advantages of this model, uh, of course, uh, improved communication and collaboration. Since the teams start talking to each other, the communication collaboration improves, and that helps in reducing the feature lead time. Uh, because when, as a dev, I'm building software, I'll be thinking about uh, how, how will the software run in production now, because I'll be maintaining that when, once it's in production. So that communication collaboration, uh, knowing uh, the story from the other side, knowing how uh, software runs in production, what are the issues that can happen, uh, that helps in writing uh, uh, stable uh, software with better quality. Uh, so, yep, as I mentioned there. So for this model to work, there are certain things that need to happen. Uh, Dev and Ops shared vision. So they are still separate teams, but they collaborate uh, together and communicate. Uh, but they need to have a shared vision of how the, the software sh uh, should look in production. What are the things they need to do correctly? What are the things they need to do differently uh, to actually have that run in production? Uh, it requires a certain amount of organizational maturity. Uh, if, if you have silos uh, and you're used to having silos, functional silos, you're just focused on doing development or you're just focusing on, on the database part if you're part of the DBA team or if, if you're an ops team, you're, you're just focused on that part. So the, it requires a certain amount of maturity for teams to start talking to each other. Once they start talking to each other, then those communication barriers come uh, down and then they, uh, they, they start seeing the problems on the other side and then start building product that's more uh, reliable, more stable. Um, also, as you saw that the dev, uh, after pairing, went back to the dev team and actually took those skills. Uh, but they also need to have those skill sets to actually self-manage the operation stack. Because as you saw on the left previously, the dev uh, uh, team was actually taking care of the deployment, monitoring servers, uh, monitoring application, not servers, and um, also supporting it in production. So that was dev and ops collaboration. The next one here is a cross-functional team. Uh, let's look at how that looks. So a cross-functional team is where you have all the different uh, skill sets that you need to build a product. So as you can see here, all the devs in that team are of different colors. So basically, they bring expertise from different areas of software development. So you, you uh, might have a front-end dev who is good at front-end stuff, but is also capable of working on other stuff. You have someone who, who has ops knowledge, uh, someone who has database knowledge, someone with back-end knowledge. So all of those different uh, expertise that you need to actually build a product and take that product all the way to production. 
Uh, obviously, uh, on the right, as you can see, uh, uh, with cloud platforms available these days, that's become easier and easier for product teams to actually uh, write the software and actually deploy, automate stuff, and then push it to production. So there is one team, one product team. Their focus is to build the right product. Uh, there are no functional teams that are focused on the functional areas like uh, database or development or operations, but it's just one team who takes care of everything uh, that's needed uh, to take production, uh, to take the software from uh, inception to production. So why, why uh, uh, think about uh, having a cross-functional team? There are certain things that help. So first one is promoting product thinking, which means that uh, now you're not thinking about your functional silo, but you're thinking about building the product right. So they do whatever it takes to, to make the right product. Whenever you're adding a feature, you're thinking about how will that affect our customers, how will the product uh, be built, and how will it run in production. So you're thinking about everything that's uh, focused around product rather than thinking about one part of the software delivery. So this needs, uh, means that the, the teams are empowered, right? So the product team itself has all the capabilities. They are empowered to make the right decisions that are needed uh, to run the, uh, to build the product and deploy it to production. And that, uh, of course, reduces the feature lead time. Uh, because there are no hands -off, handoffs between different teams, uh, that reduces the feature lead time and, and uh, uh, increases the business value that, that the business gets out of uh, putting any feature. Next one here is uh, site reliability engineering. Uh, so site reliability engineering is, uh, is it, this is the Google model where, uh, where, let's just look at, so site reliability engineering is what happens uh, when you ask a software developer to design an operations team. Uh, what that means is that uh, when, when you have a team that have software devs who can automate stuff, who can uh, make sure that this, uh, the site runs uh, reliably in production, uh, let's see how that looks, though. So as you can see here, on the left, you have the dev team and the ops team. That is there from, from the previous uh, dev and ops separation. Uh, now you have uh, an SRE team on the right instead of ops team. And as you can see that you have the red and the blue, which means that you have uh, team members who have development skills, uh, who are software engineers, who can write stuff, uh, write code, who can automate. And then you also have uh, folks in the team that can uh, know the operations part of it, uh, but can also write some code. So SRE is basically a mix of software engineers plus close to software engineers with op skills. There is a handoff here as well, um, like, like uh, dev and ops, but that handoff needs to meet certain standards. What SRE team does is that they are empowered as well, uh, and they say that, okay, if the software doesn't meet a certain standard, uh, it won't be deployed to production. So that handoff uh, uh, part is critical where uh, the dev and SRE team have to work together and make sure that uh, the standards are met. And then they, they take over, and then they still do the deployment, monitoring, uh, respond to any outages, but they also focus, as you can see there, uh, on automation, and they are also data-driven. Okay, so what are the attributes of SRE? Um, so the first thing is that if you need, your application uh, needs reliability and the uptime is really critical for, for your application. Uh, so something like Google, right? So Google, if it goes down, uh, that's a massive impact on business, right? Something like that, if you have a site or, or a software that needs to be highly reliable and uh, the uptime is really critical for you, you might want a separate team that's just focused on that. Uh, so as I said earlier, the team consists of engineers and very close to engineers with op skills. Um, and they focus on automation. Uh, they look at the data from production. 
um, and, and then look at how they can actually run the software smoothly. Uh, so whatever automation is needed, if there is an issue uh, that they need to look at, uh, they look at uh, that issue, resolve that issue, and then look at automating that so in future that same issue doesn't happen. So, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, SRE team is empowered as well. They have, uh, they have uh, the handoff when that happens that they make sure that the software meets certain standards before they can uh, actually deploy it to production. And they are data driven and, and they use techniques like uh, error budgeting. So what that means is uh, they look at the data analytics in production, uh, they use that data to make sure that how they can improve uh, running software in production, how they can make the software more reliable. And they use techniques like error budgeting, which means that uh, each team has a certain budget to make mistakes, to have errors. And if they run out of those, those uh, errors, uh, error budget, uh, they're not allowed to go to production for a certain time. So they, that uh, encourages dev teams to experiment uh, and have some leeway, but then that also means that they can't keep making mistakes. They have to keep uh, you know, up the standard of the software. So that was SRE, uh, next one being platform engineering team. Uh, platform engineering team is responsible for operating a platform which enables delivery teams to self-service deploy and operate systems uh, with reduced lead time and complexity. So as you can see there, uh, self-service part in there is in bold, which means that platform team is building a platform that can be used as a self-service uh, platform where the dev teams can call an API and then get, get whatever they want from, from the platform. If they are looking for, let's say, uh, a, a container platform, or they are looking for monitoring tools, or they are looking for uh, pipelines for their uh, application, all of those things are self-serve and, and API-based. So here's an example of how a platform team, a platform looks like. So basically, on the left, you have all your teams. And then on the right, there is a platform. And as you can see, it's API-driven. The, all these different teams call the API. And then they get all of these things on the right. You get the self-service pipelines. You get the container platform, uh, if you're using containers, uh, monitoring tools, analytics. All of those things are, uh, are, are uh, provided by the platform. And they are self-service, which means that you're not, you don't have to create tickets. Uh, to actually uh, get something out of the platform, but you, uh, you just call an API and you get those things behind the scenes from platform. This doesn't mean that the platform team uh, doesn't talk to these other teams, the app dev teams and ops team. They actually work closely with them to, uh, to, to build up the features that, that are there in the platform. Let's look at a workflow here of how um, an example workflow of how the platform team works. So I have a dev on the left. I have the platform on the right. Um, and then the first thing that will happen is I am a dev. I'm, I'm creating a new microservice. I create a new microservice. I commit my changes to Git. Uh, I, I commit all the Docker file and any YAML files that are needed for my containers to run. Uh, and that triggers a build. Uh, and then Jenkins, let's say I'm using Jenkins, that call, makes an API call uh, to the platform. And then that gives me, for the new microservice, gives me the uh, pipelines that are needed. And then if you follow a similar flow, click on that uh, new pipeline that's there, you get all the containers. If you want to register your, your new microservice with the monitoring service uh, or analytics, all of those things happen. Uh, behind the scenes from the platform. So uh, you can see the flow. It's API-based, self-serve, uh, and, and uh, the dev teams don't have to actually create tickets to get all of those done. So why, uh, uh, why actually use a platform team? Uh, that model uh, works or are needed in a lot of places because uh, your teams lack skills to self-manage operations and app stack. So if you have dev teams who are not good at automation, who cannot um, uh, work with uh, pipelines or any of the infrastructure as code stuff uh, that's needed, you might want to create a separate platform engineering team 
that does that for you. And there are various models, and I'll talk about that later, but you, you might want to keep that platform team temporarily. And once you actually enable all the, all the teams, uh, that platform team can disappear. In some cases, you might want to uh, keep that platform team around for a longer time. So yeah, this doesn't mean that the delivery teams uh, don't take responsibility for the software that they deploy on the platform. They still actually are responsible for supporting the application that gets deployed on the platform. So they use the platform, but once they deploy it, that application needs to be uh, monitored and, and supported by the delivery teams. So one of the, one of the uh, I just uh, explained the four different uh, themes there, but the key thing that I wanted to talk about is the journey. The journey of uh, an enterprise or, or a company that is on the left, which is you know dev and ops silo. How do they, uh, how do they decide which team to go with, and what are the benefits that you get out of these teams? So before I go to the next slide, though, I want to just see how many of you here are uh, actually even before this. How many do you have? Uh, you have silos, which means that you have separate dev teams, separate ops team, separate database team, and they don't talk and collaborate with each other. Can I just quickly see hands of people who are still in that model? OK, I see some hands there, a uh, few hands over there. OK, a few hands there. Uh, how many of you have dev and ops teams as separate teams, but they collaborate and communicate a lot and work closely together? Do you have that model? OK, I see a few here. OK, a few here, there. Uh, how many of you have cross-functional teams? One product team that has all the skill sets that are needed to actually take the product from uh, uh, start to finish, deploy it to production. How many of you have cross-functional teams? One, two. All right. OK, that, three, four. OK, only a few. Uh, how many uh, how, of you have an SRE team that's focused on site reliability? Interesting. I see no hands. Oh, one hand, two hands. OK, interesting. Uh, how many of, of you have a platform team? You might call it a DevOps team or, or you know, a team that actually gives you a platform uh, to deploy. One, two, three. OK, I see a few hands up there as well, a few there. OK. Interesting. All right, so uh, I just wanted to see how many of you have these different structures. And this is the slide, which is actually, I would say, one thing you want to take uh, away today. This is what I would uh, want you guys to take away. Uh, but this is still work in progress. So if you guys have any feedback on this or any question on this, come talk to me later. Or if we have some time after this, I'll be happy to answer some questions. But so I'm going to start with the left, which means this is there are companies, and I saw uh, some hands where there are still silos. There are teams that have uh, a communication barrier, a wall in between. They don't talk to each other. This is where you should aim to go, which means that you should try to be more uh, a cross-functional team uh, who has all the capabilities and are independent, empowered to actually make the right decisions for their product. You should try to go to the right most. You might be on the left. How do you actually get there? Right? So your teams are siloed. Don't talk to each other. Uh, encourage them to talk to each other. Change the, the way, the incentive, uh, how you incentivize them. Right? So if your incentive structures for your teams uh, are only for their own function. So let's say project-based, which means that if I am dev, uh, as long as I commit my code and my story is done, that is my, my, my part of work is done. That's now how incentive should be. Uh, the, the story is only done when it's deployed to production, when the features are given to the actual users. So in that case, what will happen is devs and ops, for both of them, the, the incentive structure is same. They are all about getting the feature out there in production to their users. So they start collaborating with each other. Do that with all the other teams as well. Your DBAs, your, your front end, back end. If you have separate teams, 
uh, encourage them to talk to each other, change the incentive structure so they talk to each other and they are needed to talk to each other. Once you do that, see that working. And the reason I say go from left to right and do it slow because DevOps transformation is hard. It's, it's not an easy problem to solve. You have to think about people, process, technology, all of these different things. So do it slow. Don't go directly to start doing cross-functional teams if you are on the left. Start it slow. Ask teams to uh, start talking to each other, collaborate with each other, and then slowly say, OK, if this works, let's go to the next level. Can we actually have uh, all these different members, these, these different functional teams that we have, can we actually get them together in one team and start having these product cross-functional teams and then see how that works? Do that transition slowly. Uh, so this is an ideal path where you're on the left, start going right, and keep talking about you know, uh, uh, breaking those barriers, bringing them all together. But what about the other team structures that I, I talked about today? Uh, what and when do you actually need SRE, right? So let's say site reliability and uptime is really critical for you, right? You are a Google or you are, you are a web or Amazon or one of the websites that if it goes down or, or if it runs slow, there is a massive impact back to business. You might want to think about, and I'm not saying always, but you might want to think about based on how your teams are, have one dedicated team that actually is focused on reliability, focused on uptime, and follow all the other things that I mentioned earlier with SRE. The handoff is there, but they need to, uh, the, the, the software needs to meet certain standards before it can actually deploy to production. So if you're there, you might want to go with uh, SRE there, right? And then uh, have that as a separate team, but still try to do a cross-functional team other than that operations part or SRE part. Uh, try to break down the DBA uh, front-end, back-end functional silos that are there uh, and, and work with it. What about platform engineering? So let's say you, you're trying to go right and you realize that your teams don't have the skill sets to actually manage uh, an app or operation stack on their own. So you might want to start with the platform team Build a team that's actually focused just on automation, uh, and, and they give you a platform uh, that you can use then to deploy software. They give you self-service pipelines. They give you all the other automation that's needed for your software to actually be deployed to the platform. Do that. So then you might want to go with a, a platform team there where uh, they are focused on building that platform that you need. But do you want to keep that platform team around for a long time? Uh, it depends. So if you can actually, one of the key uh, things that platform team should be looking at doing is enabling those teams that are out there. If they can enable them, uh, then they can actually disappear. So as you can see here, uh, the temp platform team, might you keep it around for, let's say, a few months, start working th with the dev teams, and say if they can take care of that platform going forward, if they can, just get rid of the platform team and then go towards more cross-functional. Uh, this is something that I've been working on for, for a bit, looking at different organizations, how they actually do transformation and what are the things they lack uh, and then how they actually go towards and approach it. This is something that, as I said, work in progress but something that I've seen in a lot of enterprises and organizations and how they approach going from left to right. Uh, yeah, this is a key takeaway, I would say. Out of anything else you want to take away, this is what I would say. Yeah, that's it. Uh, thank you, everyone. So what that really was supposed to be is who has questions? All right, we have a microphone over here. <laughs> we have a few minutes for questions. So you mentioned this uh, kind of temporary platform team, and you said get rid of them. What do you mean when you say get rid of the team? Yeah, so what I mean is, um, <laughs> 
it disappears. I didn't say get rid of them, but yeah. I, so, <laughs> so basically, uh, what you want to do is try to go across one top, right? Have that capability within your team itself, rather than having a separate team building a platform for yourself. So what, as a platform team, you start with a platform team that starts doing automation uh, and building a platform, but then start working with the delivery team and give them those capabilities, enable them. If you enable them and they can take care of the platform going forward, uh, they can run the software as well as add features to it, that's an ideal state that you should aim for, where you don't have a separate team, you have all your delivery teams that are enabled, and some of the members from the platform team can go join different teams and be part of them so that they can bring that knowledge and enable those teams. So that makes sense. But don't get rid of them. Uh, they will disappear. <laughs> cool. Thank you, everyone.